And welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and I thank you so much for joining us on the program today. And where I am today is with my special guest, who I am looking forward to having a wonderful chat with here on the program, uh, Dr. Mark Schillinger. Uh, he is involved in some really cool stuff. I want you to know that because we're going to be talking about a couple of different things. Uh, but they're going to be consolidated into one general subject. Uh, he's involved with ChallengingTeenSons.com, motivating your son into adulthood, as well as Young Man's Ultimate Weekend, mentoring young men to be happier and more independent. And Doc, thanks so much for joining us here on the program. Thank you for having me. I just want to quickly say it's challengingteenagesons.com. I was looking through the materials uh, on your website, and man, you have got it covered from the standpoint uh, of all of this. First of all, let's uh, let's acknowledge we both we both were children. We were both adolescents, teenagers, young adults. We went through that process. I'm going to ask you um, <laughs> the question. When did you acknowledge and realize that you had entered from boyhood, including teenage years, into manhood? What was that milestone for you? Wow, great question. First of all, I enjoyed everything you said leading up to this. So um, great question. A couple of things just pop into my mind, especially because you're just talking about your dad. I grew up in this tiny little apartment in Queens, New York City in the 50s, and um Every Friday night, my dad would have a card game with his men friends all in the neighborhood. I knew all of them. They knew me. I was, I think I was about eight or nine when I was invited to be the boy. And the boy was the one who lit everybody's cigars and cigarettes, made the drinks, um, went out and fetched things. And what I think initiated me into young adulthood right then, no kidding, was I got a chance to hear them, Richard, talk smack about their wives, about my dad talking about my mom. It was outrageous. And they were just good men. They were not against women at all, like you said earlier. They just wanted, they needed to be with dudes, right? So early on in my life, I got that exposure, like, oh, dudes are really important. Of course, I love my mommy and my sister to this day. My sister, you know, the women were not, they were great. And you're saying a very key point, like the men were important. So that's kind of my first recollection of saying, oh yeah, Men need men. Um, and then I went through a traditional bar mitzvah, which didn't really have much for me other than I made a whole bunch of money <laughs> at the end. And then just when I got a chance to light the cigar to say, oh, shit, I'm rich. Of course, my parents took it away and said, we got to pay for this big event. So I didn't feel like quite like a man then. That didn't quite do it. Um, I would say for me, what happened, I, I really have to say, like, for me, it was when I finished college um, and then I really decided I'd need to do something to grow up. I was in my early 20s. Like, what was I going to do to grow up? I moved from New York to Santa Cruz. I worked in a hippie bakery for a couple of years. It was really fun. I can't say I was really growing up and being a man quite then. What changed it all for me was then I had my first child. And that was like, okay, dude, you got to get a real job. You have to get a career. You know, it's nice that you want to be a musician and you have a wonderful wife and all that. That's for me, I would say that was the defining moment where I had to go look at um, colleges. I decided to be a chiropractor. I had to go fly, you know, around the country and scoping out places. I felt like that was really my initiation into like, I think I was like 27 by then. It was like, you are not a boy. You've got to make this happen. And it's on you. So I would say that was my real first defining moment of like, stuff is changing. So, so in the West, what, what is it? Is it when you reach the age of 16, you get your driver's license? 18, uh, when you can vote? 21, when you can drink? Uh, when you have your first sexual experience? When you get married? Uh, when you buy a house? When you get your first job? Well, we you know, what is it? And, and what's so sad is that even though it's different for every human being on the planet, uh, in the West, we don't even have anything that we can hook into. Talk to me about the importance of that milestone in a male's life in terms of ritual, tradition, and ceremony, regardless of philosophy. Mm -hmm. 
the first thing that comes to mind, Richard, first of all, great job, you know, ex expounding on that, because I agree with you 100%. It, it may be the number one thing that's causing our young men to become so violent or act out in so many disrespectful ways to their parents, good young men, by the way, is because they don't have this formal line of demarcation that says, you're a boy, now we need your resources, your mental wisdom, your physical skills. Now it's time to become a young man and contribute to your family, contribute you know, to your community. What I, I had this amazing experience for a very brief period of time. I was in uh, Kenya, Africa, and I got a chance to spend some time with some young men in a Samburu uh, tribe. And although they refused to tell me all the details of their rite of passage, what I want to say is that the community held these young men in such a high regard because they went through this ordeal. And one of the things they were rewarded with was now the opportunity to protect the whole community. That was their, one of their main jobs. My point simply being this is that we're suffering so much as a culture because we don't have young men who are being initiated by men who feel like they're fulfilling their biological obligation to initiate young men so that they can take good care of themselves, their parents, their family, and their community. So what's happening is young men, or I think this is what's happening is, I started the Young Men's Ultimate Weekend because there were so many young men like my son, Gabe, who's, you know, they're great kids, but especially with the onslaught of these digital devices. Uh -huh. And as you said, and, and especially as you said, look, we've dropped this out as a culture for many, many, many hundreds of years now, maybe even thousands of years. So what's happening is we have young men initiating themselves. They think, like you said, which like whether they have sex for the first time or, you know, take drugs for the first time, whatever it is, they think that's their initiation. So what's happening is they're growing up without realizing that the only way they're going to fulfill their own true potential is that they're going to need help from others to do that. Mm. So, so many young men now think they don't need help because they got their devices. They got YouTube. They got all these things. And so good parents, including myself, who was having a hard time raising my own son, there's sort of like a worldwide pandemic now of parents who have the instincts to raise their children. But there are so many factors interfering with that, including the digital devices that we have young men now who don't really know what to do. They know they don't know what to do. They will never tell their parents or their community. They don't know what to do because they have to put on that, you know, that false bravado facade that men put on. And so we're suffering because I believe it's playing out in our, you know, political economic liter leadership where the young men are not getting that. It's all about cooperation. It's about loyalty. It's about trust. It's about, caring and giving we've lost those ways and i believe it's because we're over domesticated as a culture really mm. and to me the rite of passage is the way to bring the men and the young men back so they can take their rightful place as intelligent men who know how to provide and protect was your father the kind of role model that you are trying to be to your son now or have you had to learn all of this somewhat on your own no like you richard i have been blessed i grew up in a very tiny apartment 900 maybe thousand square feet with seven people including oh, my grandmother you got me beat buddy you got me beat. That? you got me beat i do i do um <laughs> seven people my grandmother who spoke hardly any english three little bedrooms one little bathroom so i get it no like you my dad was my mentor and even though i like to say because i'm you know somebody who puts on rite of passage that at some point the young men need to get out into the community and meet the other mentors because they're more likely to listen to men um, at a certain age, you know, where they don't want to hear from their parents anymore. Like you, I was blessed to the day my dad died, which is about 10 years ago. I used to call him driving to work and I'd say, dad, what's up? How you doing? And then I would say, would you usually complain about I, whatever was going on? Mm -hmm. And he would always say, I'm no therapist, but and then he <laughs> would deliver the most beautiful, insightful, straight dope stuff that I needed to hear. Every time. I mean that every time. My mom was the same way. They're both gone, but my brothers, um, my sister who's older uh, than me, I'm 67, she's 70, my brothers are 65. We are still the same. We mentor each other. We take care of each other. And even though I thought I was going to be the same dad to my son, Gabe, what I learned early on back in the 80s and 90s was that the old way of parenting was not working. Mm hmm so acting like my dad, which included being demonstrative sometimes and maybe getting angry and, and doing things like that, um, it didn't it didn't work. It didn't go well for for my son or my daughter, for that matter. 
So my dad's style, very loving, but very firm, very direct. He had what I called the look. <laughs> look at you. I would crap in my pants and go, no problem, reporting for duty, even as a teenager. So that didn't work with my family. That didn't go well. And that's when I realized, like, I did not want to grow older. No kidding. Like, I could not envision growing older, being disconnected from my own son, who I loved, you know, like crazy, and my daughter, for that matter. So he was like 16 at the time. I was, I don't know, somewhere in my late 40s, perhaps, or, or something. But that's when I realized, like, I need to change. I need to change. Mm-hmm. And just the way you began the whole show is like what I learned first is I had to calm down. Mm -hmm. Here I was a doctor specializing in stress management. I couldn't do it for my own children. (laughs) For anybody else, I could stay as calm as a, you know, a leaf on the ground, but I couldn't do it with him. So I learned that I had to change my way. I basically then traveled to visit a mentor up in Canada. I heard about who's putting on a rite of passage. I went with my son, Gabe. It was fantastic. I came back. I knew as a teenager, I always used to pray, like, please let me do something important in the world. And I realized rite of passage was going to be the game. So I put on a rite of passage here in my uh, county, Marin County, just north of the Bay of San Francisco. And without any advertising, all word of mouth, Richard, there was 205 young men who showed up. We were expecting my son, Gabe, otherwise he'd get no allowance for that week, (laughs) and his friends. right? And there was 205 young men. And that's when I realized that I was not the only parent who had the right instincts and the right desires, but I didn't have a, a good clue on how to do this. And so as a personal growth expert in my, in my office as a doctor, I was a life, I have, I've been a life coach for many decades. I decided to change the technology that I created to help people have more fulfilling and meaningful lives and apply it to a family setting on how to integrate digital devices, how to integrate new ways of communicating to young people, um, how to develop their prefrontal cortex, how, you know, just I, I really wanted to put together a lot of things that would help not just me, but families. And so here we are 20 years later, I not only put on rite of passage events for young men and God willing someday for young women when we have the funds and the ability to do that. But I also do rite of passage events for parents because after 10 years of running Young Men's Ultimate Weekend, I realized it's not just the young men who don't know what to do. The parents don't know either. Yeah. And so I started while the young men were in, a, in the woods out with the mentors and I have been blessed to have so many great men who've been with me since the beginning 20 years later but i'm in a hotel with the parents putting on a rite of passage for them where they get to learn how to let go of their son as a boy and they get to like what's coming in your life well people who are not really ready for a life without children tend to hold on to their children so in this workshop or this rite of passage they learn to let go of their boys they learn to let go of their preconceived notions of what they are or are not i help them discover the virtues and values of their sons um, help them develop a way to communicate with their sons so that by the time both weekends are over and the parents and the young men come together, they are really ready to start working together and so that everybody can mentor each other, not mm-hmm. just the parents with the sons. So what was missing in my bar mitzvah, I didn't really get that, like, I'm a man now. I didn't get that. Even though everybody's intention was great, I just got that I'm a little bit older, and now what? So these young men really get empowered to understand that they can't blame their parents anymore for what's wrong in their lives. They go through some serious ordeals about letting go of all their anger and pain, that it's on them to help their family and to help the world be a better place. So mentoring, I think, is really what's missing. I think right of passage is what I really think is missing. And mentoring, not just for young men, of course, but for young women. So to this day, to get back to your question, I am my son's mentor still. He's 37. And he has a whole community of men and women, for that matter, that when he asks me stuff that I don't know, I go, call Stephen, call John or, you know, speak to your mom. She's she's got some friends who. And so my kids have grown up in a world of mentorship yeah. and they're both happy, productive, healthy because they know they're not alone. Right? How do you get through to these young men about their level of responsibility to themselves? Great question. A number of different ways. First of all, you know, right here in my office, I mentor young men. A lot of them will walk in with their middle fingers stuck out saying, F you, I'm not going to talk to you. I don't want to, you know, my parents are paying for you. Uh, They don't want to say anything. Or they show up at the Young Men's Ultimate Weekend. 
you know, whether there's 50 young men or 75 or 100, they're like, they're showing up the same way. I have to be here. And they don't want to take responsibility for being present, as you kind of indicated earlier. They just don't want to do it. So if I'm here in the office, I basically go, listen, I just want to ask you a question. Would you like to have a mentor show you how to move out of your house as soon as possible, where you have more than enough money of your own to do whatever you want? And they all go, sure, of course, absolutely. They do that. So that's what I tell them. I say, I'm going to be your mentor. I'm not your therapist. I'm not here as a doctor. I'm here as a mentor. A mentor is somebody who's going to help you discover who you are. So you don't have to keep being subjected to what everybody tells you you ought to be. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to simultaneously support you to learn certain virtues like responsibility, which I define as doing things you like to do and don't like to do until completion. Right. And I'm going to also help you discover how to be responsible to yourself and discover your own personal virtues and your own values, how you define those virtues and set up a lifestyle where you get to be you while simultaneously adapting virtues in your life, like responsibility, accountability, cooperation, that you'll need to develop in order to be well accepted into your family and in your community. And so if you can have a job and you develop those virtues, then you'll be able to move out and not blame anybody. So it's about being responsible. And when you're not responsible, it's about being accountable. Own it. As we say in the Young Men's Ultimate Weekend, own it, knock it off and move on. We're not going to do therapy. You're not a special need. You don't need any special anything. We're all, all here together to have personal fulfillment, shared values in the community, and help you develop your relationship to God or the universe or however you want to relate to that, which is bigger than you and includes you. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how I begin. And that's how we do it at the Young Men's Weekend. There's one very special event at the Young Men's Ultimate Weekend that I'll take a moment to tell you about because it, it, it reignites their sense of responsibility, Richard. It really does. Mm. <clears throat> the Young Men's Ultimate Weekend begins on a Friday night. As I said, the young men show up. They don't want to be there. By Saturday evening, they've only been with us 24 hours. They are totally bonding because we put them on teams and, we, and they have to pick leaders and we're there to create a container. We don't control them. We contain them. And they see that we're not there to make them wrong. We let them know that we're not there to fix them, that they're fine. They just need to be around people who can draw out of them their sense of who they are, how to be responsible, and how to give back to the world and the universe. So by Saturday late afternoon or evening, they're starting to bond. They're starting to happily be there. They see that when they're not their parents. We're not doing anything for them, and we're totally guiding them. On Saturday night, after they have their meal, they go back to their campsites. There's no structures. We tend to sleep out under the stars, occasionally tents, which many of them have never done, right? Totally opposite of what you and I had. Mm -hmm. So, right, they've never even slept out. So then at some point in the evening, they hear drums and they hear a didgeridoo in the background. It starts to get very tribal, very ancestral. They get blindfolded. They're told they're going to go on a trust walk, which they do. They put their hand on the shoulder of the young man in front of them, and they're led through some uh, you know, treacherous walks. Of course, it's safe enough for them, but it's it's challenging. Then they come to a spot um, where they're guided up some steps and they're on a big platform. And they're, they're asked the question, are you ready to become a man? And they're up there alone and there's all the drumming going on in the background. There's all these young men who are blindfolded and most of them will say yes. And then we go, lock your knees, grab your balls, fall straight back which they do. <laughs> they get caught, of course, thank God. They get caught. We take off their, their blindfold. We say, walk that way. And there's a series of tiki torches that take them to a, a place they have not yet seen on whatever site we're renting. Huge bonfire. Lots of men from the community come, plus all the volunteers that we have, which is always you know 70 or 80 men, no problem. And they're all waiting for them. And the leader of the Young Men's Ultimate Weekend, which I used to be, now there's other men taking my place because I'm in the hotel. The leader will say, young men, tonight you're going to get a chance to let go of all your past pain, hurts, disappointment, and anger. Very tribal-like. When you do this and give it your best, you will be freed up from all your excuses of not being the man you always wanted to be. And when you feel free to move on, you'll naturally be responsible because you're not going to get there without yourself. Nobody's going to come do it for you anymore. So you're going to let go of all your attachments to blaming everybody else. And then we're going to move on as men for the rest of the weekend. So it's a very physical exercise. They push up against six other adult men. And those adult men represent all their excuses, basically, or all their pain. 
the, the men don't push back. We just kind of backpedal. We let them really scream and yell and get it out. They fall to the ground a number of times after about three, four, five minutes are exhausted and they look different. And then we tell them if they're done grieving, that they're ready to join the men. And now they call their friends and the people that they've got to know over the weekend to like, do this, dude. Because a lot of the young men are like, I don't need this. I'm cool. I'm good. Now the young men say, just try this. Just do this. And so by the end of the evening, all the young men and all the men have done this. And it takes hours. And it's intense. And it's beautiful. And when it's over, we get into a big circle with all the young men and all the men. Because everybody's grieved. And the leaders of the event will tell them, you are now a man, which means you are solely responsible for your health, your well-being, what you're going to contribute and give back to your family and your community, and how you're going to get into a relationship with something that is just bigger than you and includes you, because all these things are necessary to have a happy and responsible and resilient life. The next morning, they do a, a Native American sweat lodge. And it's not so much that it's Native American, although it is, it's more about opening them up to something, someone, somehow bigger than them. That their life is not just them. It's in a container that has been created for them and for all of us. And to begin exploring their relationship to that which is bigger. So they do that very first thing Sunday morning. And then by Sunday afternoon, you know, they're winding down. We were doing all these final exercises and they're returned back to their families in this goosebumpy exercise where I basically lead them to the parents and the young men to say, we're asking you to see each other with new eyes of respect, that we respect each other for creatures of creation, creatures of God. We're all here united this way. And we're all going to need each other to make it through the challenges of life where we all have to be responsible. We're all going to share in this together. And that's how it basically ends. And they all hug and they all talk about it. That's how we bring responsibility full circle from the time they show up on Friday night to Sunday. And that's how we do it when I'm working privately with young men. It's about, it's about them and we give them the tools. The first thing we find is that they have to let go of all that pent up energy that they have. I have to tell you that what you have described is, that's incredible. Uh, because I have been through each one of those in different programs that I've been through over my 20s and 30s. Uh, and um, it is it is an extraordinary experience. That trust fall you talked about, uh, when I was uh, in an acting class, along with the trust walk, we in the acting class did that because we needed to foster a certain level of connectedness to one another in order to be able to carry out the various scenes in the scripts that were provided to us right. and trust that the other one was there. The military, in spite of my own personal uh, objections to the reasons why we have it, okay, we'll set that aside for right now. I'm with you. The military provides something that you can't get anywhere else other than maybe through the kind of training programs that you provide. All right. Um, and uh, to that end, we're talking, of course, about challenging teenage sons dot com. That's one of them. The other one is the young men's ultimate weekend uh, where we're going to give more information on how to to get in touch. But. Um, it, 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 it's something that the military has that I wish that we all, as far as males in yeah. specifically had gone through so that we could then walk around and be able to say honestly and genuinely with conviction Mark, I've got your six. All right? And we're not going to leave you or anybody else behind, no matter what the circumstance. And, and I'm not talking about military uh, 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 skirmishes around the world. Of course not. I'm talking about just day-to-day -day life. And yet, unfortunately, that's what we've done in our society here. 
We've left people behind who are they're now living on the streets. Uh, it, it disgusts me that our government asks these men and women to go off and fight their battles that they created. Then when they get back, oh, I, I, who are you? Move, get away, move away. That's basic. You know, and it's low, so what if you've got the VA hospital? So what? You're not taking care of. And then there are, there are cultures down through history who have, if, if they've actually had the equivalent of parades, they bring, no matter what the, the outcome of the skirmish was, the men coming back from battle, all battle-worn and wounded, they're honored, they're praised, they're raised up, they're taken care of in these different societies. They're not ignored. And yet we in this society, we ignore them. And I remember, I don't know if you were, there was a movie that came out called, I think it was called Welcome. And it had to do with a program that, yes, it was designed primarily for veterans. But the, the key to this movie wasn't reorienting the soldiers to civilian life. It was re reorienting civilians to the soldier. Totally. And what they have been through. And we just don't do that. I oh, think it's sure. great. And I think it's great that we have these different, different things. But going back to the to the to the bonding in the military, where yeah, you, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say something about please, that. Please go, go, please. Yes, I am. I am totally in your corner. Like, I am not. I'm not a fighter dude. I'm not, I'm not a physical fighter dude. It's not mm -hmm. me. And of course, I have the most tear jerking respect for guys who are going to go do these things. Right? Yeah. And I am convinced as a personal growth expert, like there's ways to develop um, those talents that the that the armed forces develop for our young men and for young women, for that matter, without having to go kill other people. Yeah. Right. So so I appreciate your recognition that the Young Men's Ultimate Weekend can do that. One just quick story, like one of the young men that um, came to us many years ago, like probably 15, 10, 15 years ago. Um, his dad and his mom were struggling on how to raise him. Like most of the parents and the young men I work with, they're all great people, but they just don't have what we like to say. We, we cracked the code. We figured out how to help parents and modern, you know, modern parents with the modern teenagers. But we, they came to us. They didn't, they didn't know what to do with their son. The son did the Young Men's Ultimate Weekend two or three times. He loved it. He was the typical lazy, entitled, um, good heart, but didn't want to be responsible kind of guy. And so after he did the weekend a few times, he then got that it was important to give back. Nobody made him. He became a volunteer. He volunteered a few times. Then he decided that he wanted to actually go to college and do something. And then he went into the military for four years. And, you know, we were all concerned, but he said he needed more seasoning on responsibility, on really getting organized, on really having his stuff together. He did it. He came out a couple of years ago. He and his dad, his dad became the president of the board of Young Men's Ultimate Weekend. He was so thrilled that we were able to help him and his family. Point being that when young men get that sense of respect from adults, when they're recognized and appreciated and approved for who they are and what they do, if you give them the right things to do, I'm saying this with goosebumps, they will take care of the adults. They will have the desire, they already have the ability because we bring it out of them, they will, they will fulfill their own instinctual, innate, biological drive to take care of the elders, including their parents and the children, when they are recognized and appreciated and approved for all that they've done, especially if this culture teaches them the right things to do. And that's through mentorship. So there's ways to achieve the same results that the military can get without having to send them to the military. I'm not saying that we should or should not send young men there or young women. I'm just saying, I think I'm agreeing with you. There's a way to develop those virtues without having to have them go fight wars that we have no idea what's really going on with those things. Yeah. And, and again, um, the decision on the part of these individuals to go and fight also set that aside as well. It, that's the choice they are choosing to make. Uh, it is not ours to question why, if that's what they've, you know, whatever the reason behind it, uh, let them do what they're going to do. 
course, absolutely. Yeah, because, because, uh, and don't shame them when they get back. See, I told you you were an idiot because, you know, it wasn't real and this and that. And I, you know, it wasn't, you know, I, I still I still tend to think that, that if Congress is going to uh, uh, pass a declaration of war, I think Congress should be on the front lines, you know. <laughs> they, they should go there first um, instead of sacrificing the young people. Uh, whose potential we, we lose so much potential in those kinds of things. But with that being said, um, you're absolutely right that there are other ways of, do, of doing that. And there are other programs such as yours and, and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, there are books that are out there, but there's nothing that compares with that, that, that uh, uh, practical experience. The men's group that I had in 93 when we used to go out into the mountains, uh, uh, one day uh, it was pouring rain and we we actually thought for a few moments, should we go or not? You know, I mean, and we decided to go. And there were these mountains out to the west of Phoenix. <clears throat> and uh, we got out there, parked the truck. And uh, I was the one who always got to carry the backpack filled with the food. <laughs> so, you know, but I didn't mind. I was pro- I think I was the youngest of the group. And um, when we got into the into the area, there was this this stream. And when we walked across it, uh, heading into the mountain range, uh, it was eh, maybe shin high. No big deal. And we start climbing up the rocks into the fog and what have you, because the clouds are rather low that day. And we made our way literally to the top of the waterfall that was up there. And we walked across the top of the waterfall very carefully. And it was a great experience. And so then we climbed back down again and we came to that same stream that we'd crossed over at Shin High. It was now thigh high. And so we, that's, we crossed it. That's just what we did. And um, so, but what we determined was, look, it's pouring rain. And once you're soaking wet, you can't get any wetter. And, and so we just, we kept going. We forged ahead. Um, and it was a, 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 a great experience for us. We actually went back to the same place of a week or two later. And um, in Arizona, cactus, so our cactus are protected, kind of like oak trees are here in California. Uh, so you cannot touch one if it's standing. Even if it's dead, you can't touch it. If there's one that's fallen, have at it. We had found one that had fallen. And so we began to, we'll call it disassemble. And we took out uh, one, uh, I took out one of the complete ribs of the saguaro. And I cut it in half and I still have one half of that. Uh, uh, of that. And I, it's a hiking stick now. I use it as a hiking stick. I gave the other half uh, uh, to a woman that I had met around that time as well. As a gift. But it was those experiences out in the wilderness, as it were, you know, as far as you can get from from Phoenix, uh, metropolitan area, uh, that really made a big difference. And it's why I love where I live now here in Santa Barbara. We live up in a rural area mm-hmm. and I'm up there and we had an oak tree. We have an oak tree. One of the limbs got too heavy and it broke off. So now I've and it crushed a fence and I had to repair the fence, but I had to cut up the law, the, the limb first And now I'm cutting it up into firewood. I've got to split it and do all of those things that you've got to do. And so I'm learning about how, okay, this this has to age for a little while and it could be months. I don't know what the actual duration is, if it's a year, whatever, before you can really split it. But I've got a buddy who says, no, no, you don't have to wait that long because we've got a wood splitter. It's a gas powered thing. And trimming down the weeds so that we mitigate the the fire danger. You know, we, we minimize it anyway. Uh, taking care of the septic system. Um, we have a travel trailer now, and we have that set up as if we're camping outside the house because every so often they have power outages here. So I fire up the old generator or propane tank, and we go in the trailer, we watch TV using my phone as a hotspot, and da-da-da-da-da. But there's something about being out in the outdoors. Is, is, that seems to me a key to all of this, Mark? Absolutely. In fact, I just want to mention that because uh, I love your story. And, and uh, I grew up hitchhiking out of Queens, New York City, into upstate New York or Connecticut, Massachusetts to go camping as a teenager. So like you, I had these experiences early on. 
Um, there's even books now written about the term nature deprivation, you know, for mm, young people. Yeah. Young men do not do well learning sitting and young men, some of the young women, of course, not either sitting in chairs in a, an enclosed room for eight hours. It's, we're, we're primates. We don't do well in that environment. Yeah. We need to be out and we need to be in a sense of what I like to call awe of whatever this is. Right. And so that's really, really important. We had this great opportunity a couple of weeks ago. Our program was aired on CNN. On I saw that. Called, yeah. Cool. So Lisa Ling, you know, she was amazing and she really um, loved what we did. But when I met with her a few, you know, before she started filming, she was in awe of just the site itself, just nature itself. And to make your point, you know, stronger, I said, without nature, none of this can go down because the young men need to know that they can't run away. Mm -hmm. There's no place to go. Yeah. And they need to be in a sense of awe that nature is not afraid of them and is not going to bow to them, that they have to get the sense of cooperation, that they, we all need each other. Mm -hmm. I guess is my main point. And so she really captured that really well. She did a great job understanding that we needed to be in nature. Um, and just that kind of sense of when the young men are out there and they have to rely on each other mm -hmm. to get through, that bonds them. They start to learn about cooperation instead of domination. They start to learn about actually caring instead of sort of like um, isolating themselves, which is what they usually do. They tend to learn to respect each other because they show up thinking they're the only one with the problems they have, right? And they learn to respect each other because they all have the same stuff going on, maybe slightly different stories. And so they have to work together. They um, do everything together. Nobody could get through an obstacle course or a ropes course without them all getting through. So the nature creates that environment that cannot be produced in any building. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, too, I wanted to just point out real quick when you asked me about young men and responsibility. Mm -hmm. Here's one thing I hear real quickly. Um, I went through a very painful divorce and my kids were very young when we went through that. And at the time, I didn't know how to be a divorced father. I was trying to start my practice here. I was just under tons of stress. At some point, my former wife and I, Suzanne, realized that we're not going to grow old and not having our families together because the children were just simply acting out our stuff, right? And so we realized that we actually fell in love once before because we actually liked each other and we had the same goals, which was to be personally enlightened and have a greater relationship with God or reality, whatever this is. We wanted to create a bigger purpose for us. And the purpose was to raise happy, responsible, resilient children. Mm. Once we got our act together, which we have to this day, in fact, Suzanne teaches that parenting rite of passage with me, right? But once we got our act together, it was so amazing to watch our children all of a sudden become more responsible and more accountable and want to contribute because they wanted nothing more than see their parents, even though divorced, cooperating together. So ultimately with young men, so much of it is around monkey see, monkey do. Mm. If the adults mm. are doing what we're asking them to do, they are way more likely to do it. As a brain scientist, the term is mirror neurons. You know, they'll mimic what they see. They just need to see people cooperating. And when adults are cooperating, they're going to tend to cooperate and become more responsible too. I just, just wanted to throw that in there because I know some of these listeners are divorced and yeah. I want them to know that their impact on their children is profound. And it's on us as the adults to pull it together, not the children. Uh, when, when you evaluate the quality of work put out by, and they had these two groups, uh, when you evaluate the quality of the work, the productivity and work of a group of individuals who are cooperating versus a group that are um, competing, the quality of the finished product or service is higher in the cooperative group than it is in the competitive group. Absolutely. And I wish that business as well as politics, because anytime a politician starts to badmouth his or her candidate or his or her opponent, they've lost my vote. Because what that tells me is you don't have enough to say about yourself that you have to attack your opponent and bring them down in order to lift yourself up. And I, I'm sorry, I refuse to play that game. Right. In men's work, we like to say if you have to make another man smaller to make yourself look bigger, 
you're not the man you think you are. Yeah, yeah. And and it's a really an, an unfortunate situation from the standpoint that <clears throat> it's fostered in business. I mean, it's just constantly uh, uh, that's the that's the the gist of it all is that it is fostered in, in, in business. That's the way it is. And of course, we we've seen how it's been continually fostered, uh, you know, in our, in government uh, that that we see this this situation happening and i have to say that the best example if i can put it in this context <clears throat> of of the way that um uh the president the former president as of our as of our uh, interview here the former president does business uh, not by uh, collaboration and cooperation and negotiation uh, my observation is he does it by creating as much chaos as is possible to wear down the competition in order to get what he wants. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that, and it's like, how does that help? Well, it not only doesn't it help, here's what I have found too. Everybody, every family, every community, every business needs a way. And all my travels around the world and all my inner travels and all my, my, my uh, college backgrounds in comparative religion, <clears throat> I always mm -hmm. want to know how different people related to that which is bigger than us and mm -hmm. us. Yeah. So, you know, I guess what I'm saying, though, is that the way that you deal with people like that is that you have to have a way, a way that, you know, works for you based on shared virtues and values and behaviors that will allow each person to discover who they are while also simultaneously learning the values they need to learn to contribute to the well-being of their family and community. And when you have that way, and like you said, when people collaborate and cooperate, it generates a, a resonation, an energy that wants to be maintained. It creates more love and more, more all those good virtues like collaboration and cooperation so that the people who don't do it like that, like you're referring to, they tend to go away after a while. Yeah. Because they're not being received. But the more we engage people like that, the more they're empowered because they think they're even more important than we know they're not. Yeah. So you ha everybody has to have a set way of how they live their life so that they're not divided in their attention on what's important. They know it's important. Yeah. That's what I'm finding is families are missing a way, again, in part because of the onslaught of these digital devices. Yeah. But we're becoming, we are becoming artificially intelligent. There's no doubt about it. I'm, I'm an old school guy, so I'm not leading that charge. And I can't deny that's what's happening. We just live in a culture that hasn't been given a roadmap on how to navigate through these new challenges. And so it's easy to get distracted by somebody who has a loud voice mm -hmm. yeah, okay, or a big belly. Yeah. So we have to really teach people, which is what we're doing. We're mm -hmm. teaching families how to have a shared way. And that'll get them through, and I think less yeah. distracted by all that crazy stuff. Well, and there are two elements, two morals, if you will, to to my observation, and that is number one, uh, from a biblical standpoint, a house divided against itself cannot, will not stand. And if that's your, if that's the way that you do business by dividing people, won't last. I mean, yeah, you may you may gain short term, but it's not going to last. And the second part of it is more metaphysical. And that is when you, and I said this from the outset of that long event starting in, on June uh, 15th of 2015, you can't sustain that kind of negativity and attitude without it coming back to roost. You can't. It just, because one of two things, and maybe both will happen, whatever you're trying to do will eventually fall apart number two you personally are doing damage to yourself physically mentally emotionally and spiritually totally but if people are not raised in a family or in a community that preaches what you're talking about mm -hmm. yeah then they think it's all about individuals to me, I, I, I was very early influenced by a Buddhist teacher as a teenager. And he taught me the concept of both and. Both and means that both people can be true to themselves and be right. You can disagree and still have both people be respected for their perspectives. Well, you don't need to polarize because 
We're all children of God or creator or creation, however you see that. We all have so much in common genetically that if we started teaching children that we're mostly alike, and when there are differences, it doesn't mean we're different people. Mm -hmm. We have distinct perspectives that we're that we're entitled to. Yeah. And we can actually respect people's res different perspectives if we can first relax. So we're coming back to that whole thing about relaxation. So as a doctor who specializes in stress management and life coaching, like I teach all the parents I work with, all the children I work with, all my patients, how to relax doing a simple mindfulness-based technique that takes 15 seconds so that when they feel agitated or even insulted, what I teach them is unless you're physically being threatened and harmed, we are wired to relax. And if we can relax first, then we can start seeing where the respect can develop by having distinct perspectives, but we're still humans. We're the same. We're still one. Yeah. Whether you're talking from a cosmic perspective or just an earthly perspective. And that's what I think needs to be infused in families is that that kind of perspective where everybody has the freedom to discover who they are while also simultaneously learning what needs to happen in the family and community yeah. and the world. And it's amazing the creativity that comes out of that and the collaboration that naturally organically comes out of that. All right. So now we get to those three final questions uh, for my guest here on the program. The first of which is who is Mark Schillinger? Philosopher, a lover of God or reality, creation, whatever anybody wants to call it. Um, a humble servant, helping other people be happy, healthy, and holy. I guess the way I creatively express myself the most is through music and sound. And family man, there's no way I'm sitting here in front of you, Richard, as happy and as whole as I feel right now without the love for my parents, my grandparents, my brothers, my sister, my children, my former wife, um, nephews, nieces. That's who I am. I'm a product of them. What is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you're doing now? I really believe that the only way that the world is going to make a positive transformation to the ideal realm that I envision is only when families have a way to have caring, cooperative, compassionate, collaborative relationships. Where everybody's revered for who they are and everybody's willing to be responsible for the well-being of everybody in their home and in their community. And finally, what is your life's purpose? Pretty much the summary of the first two things I said. My purpose as a teenager, I used to hitchhike, you know, go camping and carry books like The Compassion of Buddha in my pocket or Teachings of Lao Tzu or teachings of Jesus or Moses, whoever. I was enthralled by all of them. To me, my the way I see my purpose is to integrate all that I've learned, combined with my own instinctual abilities and insight and wisdom, and create myself in the most free way, uh, respectful way, provocative way, so that I can go to my own deathbed complete with the journey that I took. And finally, what is your life's purpose? I, I, I feel like I've, that's it, to help families. Okay. To help families have more care. I mean, if I could, if I could be that person who got out on TV right now and was in front of the whole world, which I would be willing to do, it would be to teach people how to really go deep within, like you said, that quiet voice within, really discover who they are, their own personal virtues, their own values, and create a lifestyle where they get to creatively express that as long as it's respectful to themselves and all others. And then I think by doing that, people would naturally want to care and cooperate with all others. That's what I see. That's my mission. That's my goal. That's what I'm dedicated to. And there's nothing more rewarding than working on that because I'm convinced now after all that I've studied and done, it's only going to happen through the agency of families to have a better world. Well, Dr. Mark uh, uh, Schillinger, thank you so much for joining us on the program. We look forward to having you back again.